Jesus. Hello and welcome to Live at Epifan, Thursday afternoon. We're here live uh, on the Epifan Show. Uh, thanks for joining us today. And my colleague, Matt, good to see you as always. Hi, nice to see you, Dan. Thanks for having me on again. How are you today? Yeah, I'm good. I'm oh, good. Well, hey. Have you been out walking your pug today? That's my first question. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. He's, uh, he's happy, he's walked, and... Uh, empty now so all good <laughs> <laughs> and it and is uh, and is bailey the pug sleeping under your desk right now or did you have to move him out no i moved him out today just in case the snoring interfered so uh but maybe in the future he'll make an appearance bailey snoring is like a regular occurrence on our video conferencing meetings these days so uh it's always it's always funny we i don't know if we have enough um uh audio filtering to remove those snores from this show if there is <laughs> close by <laughs> possibly not no <laughs> yeah uh so uh our topic today h265 hevc uh what is it what does it mean well hevc there is an acronym there it's high efficiency video codec and h265 well that's one better than h264 right matt yep <laughs> Soon yeah. to be H2.66, <laughs> I guess. Well, maybe we'll wait until next year. Um, but H.265 is definitely a codec that we've been talking about for a number of years now. And finally, it's starting to become more applicable, maybe. So we thought we'd cover the topic a little bit today. Um, and also, we have some kind of interesting news related to Epifan as far as H.265 goes as well. Um, but I guess just to sort of start things off, um, what is H.265 in your, in your view, Matt? Like, have you encountered this codec before and when, what's your, um, sort of knowledge of it? So for me, H.265 H. is, is basically an improvement on H.264. So it, it, it allows you to compress files to a smaller size, but, uh, at, with, whilst also using less bandwidth if you're streaming. So it's basically, a, it's a great tool for those of us that maybe use cameras that generally film very high file sizes. Um, and now obviously if, if you can reduce the size of your files, then it means that you can get more content captured um, within whatever card space you have. That, that would be my perspective as a shooter. I'm just seeing uh, Danny Grizzle in chat saying H.265 sounds great for studio work on a fixed set with a lot of static pixels. How about outdoors, real world, with a lot more dynamic frame, tree leaves and such? Um, and you're also asking Danny about our signal encoding path. Maybe we'll get to that in a little bit, but I want to answer your first question first. Um, I think we might actually have a little bit of an example here. Uh, and you brought up a good point is more dynamic pixels. So this is a demo here I'll share from a couple years ago with a fresh faced young who is that handsome young lad there? Uh, <laughs> oh, wait, that's that, I think that's me um, <laughs> uh, This is an example of a video that was encoded at a constant bit rate of 3 megabit and you'll see early in the video here um, I'm just on a plain gray background and I'll pause it there and you know, you can kind of see like the encoding quality it's not amazing or anything but it's at three megabit it's it's passable uh, on this plain background as you start to introduce some more elements let's see what happens so let's put a motion background in there all right okay let's add some lower thirds onto the frame how does that change things not too much of a difference right now okay looks all right let's add some flames Let's go ahead and add some big flames in the studio. And now you can see things are starting to fall apart a little bit. Uh, you know, we lost the definition on my face. You know, previously I was a little more obvious, like the, the you know, the lines around my hand and the definition on my shirt collar and stuff. It's starting to really, I can't really see my eye as well. It's just sort of a mushy blob now. Let's add some more moving pixels, Danny, and see how this changes things. More flames. <laughs> and 
there you see, yeah, it's not looking quite as nice. And if we want to push it even further, let's add some snowflakes. Okay, we have a lot of... This is, this is I would say, a difficult encode right here. And you see the more stuff you have going on, the lower quality you actually get on your image. And here you see, like, like wow, you can't even tell I'm wearing uh, a pinstripe shirt anymore. It's all just blended in together. So this kind of shows, you know, depending, I think you made a good point, Danny, is like, depending on what it is you're trying to encode is going to affect the quality you get with a fixed bit rate. I see Danny saying now, I'm planning a location live stream via bonded cell modem so H.265 can make a huge difference by reducing bandwidth requirements on a cell data connection. That's a really interesting point. What do you think about that, Matt? It's funny. I think we were discussing this earlier on in the week. Um, yeah, I, I think that it, it's a huge push for technology, and we're definitely going to see H.265 kind of incorporated into cell phones a lot more it, it already is i believe um so it, the capabilities of where it can take you mobily kind of without having to have all the technical aspects behind you in terms of a big camera or a crew or anything um that that could be really promising um i've never actually used it myself in application so i, I couldn't speak to that but uh definitely excited by the idea of uh, where it could take us and what sort of quality we could get out of that in the future too. Mm -hmm. I think the word that I use to relate to H.265 is efficiency, right? Like what kind of result can you get with a fixed amount of bandwidth or a fixed amount of data or bitrate, right? So there's kind of two ways to look at it in some sense. There's the example that Danny mentioned in chat is he's trying to stream over cellular network. Well, hey, there's a great use case for H.265. Not only are you probably paying per gigabyte <laughs> when you're using bonded cellular, um, you might also have a limit to what kind of speed you can do. So if you can double the compression factor of your content, that means potentially you could have half the bandwidth requirement for the same quality. The other way to look at it is you could increase your quality with the same amount of bandwidth. So for example, maybe you have a 20 megabit um, speed on your bonded cellular network. Um, you could potentially be doing something like 4K at a lot higher quality than, um, than well, even if you had less bandwidth in that like let's say you had 10 megabit you can maybe even be doing 4k at 10 megabit when typically you would only be able to do 1080p at that bit rate um i am seeing the keep the conversation going here danny says uh i'm concerned about a situation where moving clouds can cause sunlight and shadow to sweep across the background of my frame i think that's a good point and you know i think h265 probably helps you there danny to be honest because you with with H.265, because you have better compression, you're better able to handle all of those moving pixels in your image. Um, so, you know, you can probably have a higher quality encoding at, you know, at your potentially lower bit rate. So it's, it's I think, I would think it's to your advantage to be using H.265. Um, what do you think, Matt? Like, have you have you encountered H.265 at all? Like, have you ever encoded to H.265, whether it's live streaming or, or otherwise? Uh, yeah, definitely from kind of like a videography perspective. I've worked with H.265 uh, recording high frame rates uh, with the same premise, basically, that, you know, usually when you're recording high frame rates, it's super large files. Um, and H.265 allows you to kind of keep those files compressed. Um, while while maintaining that quality. Uh, so my experience is that it, it has its benefits, but it also has its drawbacks. Um, H.265 is quite current. Um, so if your computer and your hardware isn't as current, then that can be a little bit of an issue too. Um, but generally speaking, there's more benefits to H.265 than I would say there are drawbacks for sure. Good point. Well, let's get into 
some of the pros and cons a little bit here. Um, so I'm gonna start with a pro, and that is what we mentioned before, efficiency. And actually, we have a good example here on the Epifan blog. There's an article article here from Michael, and uh, this has a table in it where you can kind of compare the bandwidth requirements. So in terms of efficiency, okay, here we go. So at H.264, if you want to stream in 4K, it's recommended that you have at least 32 megabits per second bit rate. Whoops, sorry, I lost the chart there. Let me get back to it. There we go. Um, H.264 for 4K, you're going to need 32 megabits per second to be able to stream that effectively and get a good quality out of it. H.265, if you want to stream in 4K, you're only going to require 15 megabits per second. That's half, right? That's amazing. Yep. Um, likewise, you know, you could be doing a 1080p stream at 3 megabits per second. So, you know, to relate this back to Danny's example, whereas perhaps maybe his cellular network is only reliable up to three megabits well he's maybe now streaming 1080p where previously he would have only been streaming 720p so that's a big pro for sure is efficiency but we're talking about efficiency with bandwidth and streaming but that could also relate to recordings as well like maybe you're not requiring a live stream but like matt you've you've recorded a lot of video and stored it and taken it into post-production what advantages from efficiency standpoint would there be in terms of recording h265 um well definitely space obviously so i mean it's the same sort of principle here where you're looking at uh kind of half the space as well so let's say that originally you were recording something in 4k 120 which i believe is uh something that a lot of now kind of standard DSLR cameras are aiming towards. Um, that's that's something that would originally have taken up gigabytes and gigabytes of space, potentially 30, 40 gigabytes per shot. And if you can reduce that down to 10, 15, 20 gigabytes per shot, then you know, you're, not, you're looking at being able to capture more footage without having to waste time transferring footage if you fill up a card, um, carrying less equipment with you too. Uh, so in terms of the efficiency on that side, it's great. Um, but then there, there is a drawback on that side too, uh, which can work with efficiency as a negative. So if you're looking at working with H.265 on an older system, then potentially the efficiency that you get with filming you, you can potentially lose that in post if you then have to go transcode your footage uh, in order to be able to play it back properly. Um, so I was actually speaking with one of our colleagues before the show um, and he made a good point that, you know, I, I'm an Apple user, so current Apple computers with the M1 chip are gonna make H.265 footage flow like butter, but if you have an older system, then it's gonna struggle with the H.265 unless you transcode it. So those are where you kind of see the benefits and the drawbacks in the same conversation. That's a really good point you make there is while compressing things down into a more efficient codec has the advantage in terms of file size and bandwidth requirements, you are oftentimes requiring more compute, more you know, processing power to both encode and decode um, that codec, right? So it's yeah. not just a matter of needing the right hardware to capture and encode to H.265. You need the you need the hardware on either the post production side or on the receiving end of that signal uh, to be able to decode it. Um, so your kind of your trade off is yeah more more compute required and. Uh, I think about, you know, times when you're trying to do post-production in maybe Adobe Premiere or uh, whatever editing system you use. Being able to scrub through shots really smooth uh, is a huge help. Um, and you're definitely going to require a more beefy machine to be able to, you know, s like you mentioned, like sort of scrub through shots more smoothly yep. um, if, you're, if you're encoded. So you might find yourself, instead of editing natively with h265 encoded files you might be doing your post-production with 
you might need to transcode to an intermediary codec to be able to uh, to be able to you know do post production on your system. Well, that's definitely that is definitely a consideration. Yeah, that's definitely what I found when I'd shot with uh, the R5. Uh, we did some shots with Epifan actually uh, not too long ago, and we were shooting 4K 120, and uh, that was the issue that we had. I'm on a, I don't, I don't want to say an old system. It's it's before the M1 chips, let's say, um, and this is where you you really do see those issues where you know, being able to scrub through one shot really quickly to be able to keep an edit going and stay on pace is really important. Um, and transcoding is not a huge issue, but it's just an extra step that you should be wary of if, if you don't have the hardware to back up kind of like the, mm. the compression that you're working with. Yeah, oh, that's a good point. I'll bring up another pro and that is, you know, the consideration of your bandwidth. And I think we talked about that a little bit already, but you know, in, in certain production settings, bandwidth can be a limiting factor. You think about something like a live event at a hotel ballroom. You don't know what kind of internet you're going to get when you show up sometimes like and in in many cases you may actually be paying a premium to the venue to get a more dedicated internet connection uh, another example is like at a, at a large trade show maybe you have a booth where you want to be either streaming video in or out of the booth um, the the internet service available in those type of event venues is often very limited and to get the higher end package is more expensive well, Matt, if, if all you want to do is maybe stream 1080p quality, you know, um, maybe you're instead of requiring like the 20 megabit package from the event venue, maybe you can survive with the 10 megabit package and save yourself, you know, some cost on your on your Internet connection. Um, or if you are paying for gigabytes of total bandwidth streamed, like those costs would be cut in half um, if, if you're paying for data usage. So. Uh, yeah, that is a big consideration just in terms of like maybe cutting costs even or costs with storage like you think of hard drives like they're not they're not cheap like when I look at some of the new cameras now recording 4k 120 like you said Matt um, The file sizes can be massive. You can fill up a 32 or a 64 gigabyte card You know very very quickly half hour of footage type thing um, and then inevitably you're going to find yourself needing to store that on a cloud service, whether it's a Dropbox or a Google Drive, like that, that, that has a, 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 an incremental cost. And over time, as more and more of your footage adds up, those, uh, those storage costs increase. So, um, yes, definitely some opportunity to save cost with H.265 um, if you're willing to invest in the hardware a little bit. Uh, but let's let's get into that as a con a little bit more, Matt. Like we were talking about hardware. Um, there's post production. Is there is there any other cons that you can think of to H two six five? Why why you wouldn't want to uh, make the switch? Um, I I think it's those those are the things that would stand out to me personally. Um, it it would be mainly just not wanting to update. You know, I, I guess there's my my entire system for example um and kind of balancing the pros and cons between where the efficiency was was seen most do i appreciate the efficiency in terms of shooting and capturing or do i appreciate it in post more personally i think i i appreciate it in post more because that's that's where i end up spending most of my time uh once a project is shot or once i have the footage Whereas, you know, as nice it is as it is to have smaller file sizes on the cards that I'm shooting on, I think that the time saved in post production is probably more valuable to me personally. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I guess it really, your mileage may vary depending on your use case. Where do you want Absolutely. your efficiency um, on the capture side, on the post production side? What What's going to work for your workflow? Um, I wanted to point out uh, uh, a video. This is a video on the Epifan YouTube channel called H264 versus H265. Great informative video here with our host Loray. Um, just wanted to share this. This is CDNs. CDNs that support H265. Um, and there you've got some of the big ones. YouTube, uh, AWS, Wowza, Dacast, Brightcove. 
all of these do support H.265 now. That's incredible. Um, but a big caveat here, not compatible with RTMP streaming. So you are going to require um, a streaming um, protocol like HLS, for example, on YouTube, if you want to be able to take advantage of the possibilities of H.265. So that's kind of a big, kind of a big note there. But um, with something like uh, Pearl Nano, you would have no problem doing that. And in fact, I we think we can make a little bit of an announcement here: is that next week, Pearl Nano will have a firmware update for 16, and it will enable H.265. So HEVC H.265 coming to Pearl Nano next week, and we'll be pretty excited for that. Um, Another big advantage as well, Matt. Uh, what else is coming to What else is coming to Nano next week? Uh, in terms of oh well, uh, in the four sixteen update, we have H two six five. We also have four K. Oh, four K. Yes, yes, which is huge. I might add because as much as you you see that ten eighty p has been the standard for. I hesitate to guess, probably about a decade now, maybe a little less. Uh, 4K is really becoming the standard nowadays, which is, I think, why H.265 is really coming to the forefront here. Um, so to see that incorporated into the Nano with the technology that it offers to be able to stream in 4K, I, I believe we would be kind of like a, a leader in that space, wouldn't we, Dan? Well, certainly having h265 on your encoder is not like a common a, a common thing um i would think that in the in the the size and format of something like a pearl nano we we're pretty unique there to be able to have a big feature like h265 and 4k um and you know with 4k you can really start to take advantage of that more with h265 so lots of possibilities maybe you want to stream srt in 4k or maybe you want to stream um using something like hls directly to your cdn and have an efficient 4k stream at the same bit rate you used to do with 1080p that's all possible um so very cool so Noga's here is the 4k update for nano free uh you do the 4k nano update is a paid feature so hevc is going to be free with the 416 update so that's included for all pearl nano users um for for 4k i do believe it is an add-on feature and you're going to be able to find that right on the epifan website we will have a, an email going out next week sonoga that'll inform you of when that's available i think it'll be available on the 13th so you'll be able to find all the information on epifan.com um yeah, so I don't know if you want to nerd out here a bit, Matt, but I know you were looking into like kind of how these codec technologies actually work. Um, and you were looking into this. This is a blog on BoxCast that kind of like got into the weeds of like how it, how these codecs actually yep. encode efficiently. Can you tell us a little bit more? Like what actually is happening with H.265 that's allowing this increased compression? What is this magic that <laughs> so it's, makes it's, all of this possible? It's kind of a little ironic in ways. Um, so H.264 was built up mainly using macro blocks, which were kind of, as you can see on the screen here, 16 by 16 pixel size. So the, the pixels that they're using are smaller, um, which technically means that there's more compression to be done because the smaller pixels, you need more of them. Um, the macro blocks end up being larger in terms of the quantity, but maybe not in terms of the actual pixel size. Whereas H.265 is using CTUs, um, which are larger in terms of their pixel size, which means that when it comes to compression, there's actually less compression to do, despite the fact that the pixel sizes are larger. And you might tend to think that having smaller pixels usually results in a higher quality image which is why I said there's kind of somewhat a contradiction here when you think about it logically that the pixel sizes are larger but you're actually getting a better quality out of it. So it's, it's a really interesting compression technique that I think is 
is really going to kind of push things forward. And there's there's certainly other compression um, and codecs out there that are looking to maybe go one step further. I don't think they're quite on the horizon just yet, but uh, I imagine they'll probably be using similar principles. Very interesting. So like in the example we see here in the image, it's it almost looks as though H.265 is able to determine which areas need smaller compression blocks, like based on the detail of the scene, it's a little bit more intelligent, you know, Absolutely. something like this, this purple background, like there's not a lot of detail in those areas of the image. So why would you need to have, you know, a 16 by 16 macro block to compress one area that's just purple, right? Absolutely. You're wasting a lot of data on, you know, essentially areas of the picture which don't require that kind of detail and encoding clarity whereas you know with h265 it's kind of focusing in here more on the details like the places where you know the the strings on the guitar like that need more detail and the the fine definition in her earrings and her eyes and so on and so forth it's really it's breaking those clusters up and with more details and it's sort of leaving the the areas of the image that don't require it alone and not using as much of the encoding horsepower on those on those sections which makes yeah. sense but which uh, also incredible art intelligence in terms of technology i mean to think that it can in real time decipher what needs more compression and what doesn't is it's really incredible to think that that's where we're heading towards and well h265 has achieved it yeah um, you did touch on other uh, codecs. Yes. Maybe we could uh, take take a glance. So we've been we've been hearing about H.265 for years now, but really it's just starting. This is the first time we'll have that capability with Epiphan Pearl, which is exciting. Um, but you know there are other codecs out there that you've heard of, and you know we take a look here. This is an interesting blog on Bitmovin that you could find, um, and this t looks at some of the codecs that are in use and like what people will be using in the next 12 months and interestingly at the top of the survey here is H.265 25 percent of people responded that they would be using H.265 in the next year which is fascinating uh, considering H.264 is much lower here so I'm not sure who they pulled with this survey but there are some other interesting notables here AV1 being one of them which is an open source codec that we're starting to hear more and more about and I think it relates more closely to things like streaming for your content delivery, things like Netflix or Amazon Prime and, and things like that. So we also see H.266, which, um, you know, I haven't had any familiarity with that. VP9, which I think is a compression that's used for YouTube for content delivery. So, yeah, just interesting to sort of watch the codec the codec wars play out and see what gains in popularity. I think accessibility is a big factor, but uh, you know, depending on whether you're recording, whether you're streaming, whether you're viewing content, different codecs will come into play depending on you know what different workflows and what different content paths exist. So uh, we'll we'll keep our eye on an AV1. Who knows? Maybe we'll see that come into prominence more for production in the future. Um, question for you though, Matt. Sure. Um, I know you're always keeping up on cameras. What can we expect in terms of recording with cameras? You know, what can we expect? Are we should we expect to see H.265 as like a standard feature on cameras in the near future, or is it already like what? What, um, is, what are you seeing out there? I, I wouldn't say it's quite standard just yet. Um, it's definitely something that I think will become standard though and I think for all the reasons we discussed um, definitely efficiency file sizes um, in terms of frame rate uh, I think that any cameras that shoot high speed that aren't full cinema cameras with their own raw codec um, are definitely going to be using H.265 potentially in the future H.266 which I think was VVC, which stands for Versatile Video Codec. Um, they're basically coming up with new codecs all the time to be able to get these file sizes smaller with less bandwidth on the streaming side of things. 
Um, so I think as you continue to see things go from 1080 to 4K to 6K to 8K, so I think even Blackmagic has a 12K camera now, um, you know, you're gonna have to start seeing that codecs are gonna have to move with the technology in terms of cameras because no one's gonna wanna be shooting 12K on a 64 gigabyte card and only get three seconds of footage. So um, I yeah. think I think it's important and I think we'll definitely see more of it. I think that some of the other ones on that, uh, that kind of pie chart that we just saw or that graph, um, they're already kind of tailoring towards 6K and 8K, which is why maybe people don't hear about them because not many people are working in that file size yet or that resolution. Um, so I think in the future, definitely, uh, H.265 will become a standard and maybe even you know H.266 will be here sooner in the public eye than we think it will. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, it's I'd say often overlooked how important video compression really is. It's the, really the magic sauce that makes everything we do possible, certainly on this show. Um, we could maybe mention how uh, I think Danny was asking a little bit about how we do this show. Um, and essentially both Matt and I are streaming from Pearl devices into our studio, which is remotely operated um, in, in our office in Ottawa. So we're both just in our home offices. We stream SRT to the studio Pearl, which is a Pearl 2. Um, and from there, the show is mixed using Epifan Cloud completely remotely and streamed up to YouTube. So Jeremy, our show producer uh, today is, is switching the show and he's, I think, just sitting in his living room uh, doing it on a laptop. So uh, pretty cool what's possible with efficient codecs and being able to do more remote stuff, thinking about bringing in remote guests or um, you know, uh, aggregating content from multiple studios or multiple remote people, having that efficiency of your codec is, is huge. Um, I was just gonna share this, you know, maybe maybe Matt in the future will have uh, will have Pied Piper uh, of Silicon Valley fame inventing yep. some video codecs. I forget what is it, middle out. We need a middle out codec <laughs> once we get to like twenty k cameras. That's the only way we'll get the compression we need. So I'm pretty sure there was another algorithm in that episode which isn't quite as appropriate for this live stream, but. Uh... Yeah, it's a, <laughs> yeah. This, uh, it, that's a great show and uh, if you if you want to see kind of how important compression is then maybe watch uh, some of the first season and see how Pied Piper based their entire company around that so yeah Fictional, no kidding obviously. Um, <laughs> yeah power the video power that powered rust rust fest <laughs> for anyone who knows the final season rust fest and that giant hologram uh, that was probably h265 I, I, or maybe maybe they were using some Pied Piper magic. Um, let's slip over to the kitchen very quickly and uh, just a couple quick Epifan announcements uh, before we wrap up today, Matt. And I've got still a little bit left on my coffee here. There we go. Um, yeah, so I think we kind of already let the cat out of the bag. But yeah, next week, April 13th. Uh, 416 update for all the Pearl Nano users out there and we will have HEVC um, and optional 4K upgrade and then what else is happening uh, April 23rd to the 27th we have one of the biggest shows of the year which is NAB in Las Vegas Epifan will be there and we'll be exhibiting at NAB I believe it's booth C9917 maybe we could type that into chat can come visit us there um also i do have uh, a code here that you can use when you if you do want to register for nab to get a free ticket and that code is uh, maybe i'll put it in chat right now um nab code and there we go nab code lv2343 so hey if you want to go to nab and not pay <laughs> use that code when you register and you'll be all set. Um, one other little content bit we wanted to highlight. This thought this was cool. This is from Michael. Uh, new blog article, Lecture Capture Solutions, three options for your school. 
Um, I know we have a lot of folks out there who are planning for 2022-2023 school year. And if you want to take a, a nice look at some lecture capture philosophy, you know, how much time do you need to deploy a lecture capture solution? What kind of budget do you need? What, what equipment do you need to do lecture capture in a really great way? Um, this blog post is a great start. And I know we're going to have a lot more content in the near future about lecture capture. I'm trying to think of how lecture capture would benefit from H.265. And one of the things I could immediately think about is if you are recording in the classroom, lectures can be long, hours long. Um, maybe H.265 recording is a good solution to reduce the storage costs of your lecture capture solution. Or maybe you're using something like, uh, like, a, like a CMS and this isn't really an issue for you but uh, who knows maybe see some of the major CMS's will support H.265 if they don't already so just something to watch for um, and that's about it I don't know if we have any other big items uh, Matt any other thoughts for today not really just what excited excited to kind of see where this takes us in the next couple of years as I said I think H.265 is probably going to become the standard but uh, you know, technology moves so quick these days. You know, we could be seeing 24K soon enough in terms of resolution. <laughs> yeah. Who knows? That would be wild. That's a lot of pixels, man. A lot know. of pixels, uh, yeah. Is it really required? You know, here's... I always think, like, resolution is just a number. <laughs> yeah. I care way more about the bit rate of the encode on the camera. And that's a piece of information they don't always give you with the camera, right? Yep. So uh, I do appreciate it when a camera tells you, hey, this is recording a 600 megabit encoding to your, yeah. to your CFast card or whatever media you're using. Um, I do see Jan Danny Grizzle saying thanks in chat. Danny, thanks for joining us. It was great to uh, have you here today and thanks for participating in chat and Sonoga, you as well. Hope you guys have a great afternoon. And as always, you can always connect with us on social media here on YouTube, uh, we're on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, YouTube, Instagram, you name it. Um, you can also just go old school and send us an email, info at FFN.com. And why don't we leave it at that? Thanks for hanging out today, Matt, and I'll see you again soon. Cheers, guys.